Please turn in your Bibles this morning to the book of Matthew and chapter number 7. We are going to wrap up this passage of Scripture here and the series here on these thoughts that the Lord Jesus gives us here. And as you turn there, I want to remind you that the setting that we're reading from is sometimes called the Sermon on the Mount, where disciples come around Him and He speaks specific things to them. But there seems to be also a crowd gathering as He finishes up His message. So it's not just to the disciples, though some of it is, but not all of it. And as they gather around Him, and He begins to speak these truths. And so the emphasis has been on the phrase, these sayings. And I realize as you read, you always want to pay attention to the context in which it's given. And I realize that most of this is given primarily to the nation of Israel as he is addressing them about certain issues. And uh, so then he's going to present himself to them. Of course, they reject him. But boy, I tell you, you know, when you talk about the sayings of Christ, you'll find that the church uh, doctrine in the church epistles, they just reinforce the sayings of the Lord Jesus Christ and His principles. And so I want you to notice, I think that this passage that I'm going to read to you this morning has got to be some of the most sobering words of the Lord Jesus as far as personal uh, things and as far as our relationship with God and the possibility of our being deceived or deceiving ourselves. And so it requires of us much diligence to seek out our heart, make sure that we're honest and open before the Lord. Because you think about it, how many churches did you, buildings did you pass by coming here today? And how many religions are there on planet Earth? And how many of them believe that they're on the right track? And what separates us from them? I think these are all false worthy of contemplating, don't you? So let's look in Matthew chapter number 7, and let's look at what Jesus said in verse number 13. Bear with me as I read a few verses, all right? Got a lot of ground to cover, a lot of stuff to give you. Critical. You may have to go back and listen to it again. What I don't want to do is turn it into a classroom. What I do want with all my heart is to help you. If I had to entitle this message, and I'm not real good at titles, I would, it would be, inspect me, then thee. Inspect me, and then thee. All right, now look what he says in verse 13. Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. Now I'm already getting nervous. Only few, right? Only few. You're going to be in the minority. If you're on the right track, as far as the world is concerned, you're going to be in the minority. Verse 15. Beware of false prophets, which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. You shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? And that's an obvious answer. Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit, is hewn down and cast into the fire. Wherefore, by their fruits you shall know them. And that ought to tell you something right off the bat about chapter 7, verse number 1, where he says, Judge not, lest you be judged. There are times when you are not to condemn others. There are times when you must be slow in judging others, but God does not want you void of discernment. And He says in verse number 20, Wherefore by their fruit you shall know them. So is it all right to be a fruit inspector? I tell you what, every one of you ladies go to the grocery store 
and you buy some produce for your family, I'll guarantee you, you are fruit inspectors, produce inspectors. You're always checking to make sure. And if my wife sends me to Walmart to pick up a few, things, few bananas, I'm not coming back with apples and oranges. I'm coming back with bananas. All right, notice in verse 21. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works. And I want to remind you again, he's speaking in the context of false prophets. Of false prophets. Have we not prophesied in thy name? Okay? Verse 23. And then will I profess unto them, who? The false prophets. I never knew you. Depart from me. Ye that work iniquity. Therefore, now he's saying you need to examine, or should I say inspect, every preacher that you are under or here on the radio, television, internet, books, tracks, booklets, you are to carefully inspect those men and their personal lives. Now watch what he says here. Now that you're to inspect me, but also then thee. Look in verse 24. Therefore whosoever, that's you, Heareth these sayings of mine, and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man, which built his house upon a rock. The rain descended, the floods came, the wind blew, and beat upon that house. It fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. And every one that heareth these sayings of mine, and doeth them not, shall be likened unto a foolish man, which built his house upon the sand." The rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat upon that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. And it came to pass, when Jesus had ended these sayings, the people were astonished at His doctrine. Do you realize that Jesus actually taught doctrine? We live in a generation where that word makes people nervous. When you say, well, that church down there, they preach Doctrine, we don't. Well, that ought to be an alarm that goes off for you right then. Because Jesus taught doctrine. And the Bible says that they were astonished at His doctrine. Verse 29. Because you see, when you teach doctrine, you're, you're teaching Scripture and you are speaking then with authority. Not yours, but delegated authority from the Word of God. The Bible says in verse 29, For he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. Now Jesus in verse number 15 says, Beware. Now he only says that a few times in the New Testament. One of them has to do with the leaven of the Pharisees. He kept repeating that, Brother Zach, over. Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. What was the leaven of the Pharisees? It was hypocrisy. It was saying, but not doing. And they were building their house upon the sand. And the man who builds his house upon the rock is the man who hears and then does what the Lord says according to His Word. So many of you can carry a Bible, but do you actually do what the Bible says when it's very clear what the Lord would have you to do? All right, now watch. I want you to consider something here. Would you agree with me in, in verse number 15 uh, down to uh, verse number 23 that Jesus Christ is warning us of how dangerous a path we must trod because we are caught between two worlds and two gods. We're, when I say two gods, I'm talking about big G-O-D and little g-O-D. I'm talking about the God who created us, and I'm talking about the God of this world, and we are caught between the two. 
And the, the one that we hope and trust that we're following is the God of truth and the God that cannot lie. But the other God is the God who is nothing but a liar, who cannot tell the truth, and who is a deceiver, and whose power lies in deceit. So, I'm caught between these two. That's why Jesus said, strive to enter in. In other words, you're going to have to make some effort in your heart to be honest before God that you might know the truth. Okay, so let's look at this passage here. And by the way, do you agree with me according to what Jesus said? And I'm sure that you do. According to what he said here, some men are not what they appear to be. Can you say amen right there? He said that they're going to be in verse number 15, that they will come to you in sheep's clothing. But what are they inside? Ravenous wolves. Ravenous wolves. So, number one, don't be gullible. Don't be naive. And understand that according to the word of the Lord, some men are not what they appear to be. What they even profess to be. Notice what he says again. He says, not everyone says unto me, Lord, Lord. So they may use his name. But according to verse number 21, they will not do His will. All right? That has to do with the Word of God. It has to be with a submissive spirit. Verse 22 says also that they may do some feats or some works in His name. But He says to them, get away from me. I never knew you. These were not people who professed that were actual believers and then they fell away. These are people doing things in the name of the Lord, but they are con men. You believe in con men? Somebody always after your money. Somebody's always after your money. Somebody always pretends to be the IRS. Somebody always pretends uh, uh, to be uh, in your best interest, trying to sell you something, or et cetera. Now, listen, there, we got a missionary. For example, we've we got a missionary that we have supported for a long time. I'm talking about decades, named Brother Carl Miller. How many know where he's a missionary to? Where's he at? He's in Scotland. From Texas, in Scotland, great man of God, has suffered greatly, and been persecuted and yet been faithful where he is there in Scotland. I'm friends with him on social media, and I noticed that on social media that somebody, well, I suspected that somebody had got into his account and hacked his account. Because, Brother Travis, what was starting to happen was, it started all of a sudden, here's Carl Miller, he got his picture. Got his name. I mean, they've got everything. They've got his Facebook account. They've got his messenger account. They've got everything that looks just like him. And they're promoting uh, the um, uh, investing in Bitcoins. Okay? And so what they're doing is, so I noticed, I, I told Cindy the other day, I said, a missionary is not going to do this. Because what it said was, Brother Carl Miller was saying, hey, look, here's 60 acres in Texas that I just purchased with the money I made off of Bitcoin. I said, first of all, if he's a missionary, he's not going to let all those pastors know he just bought 60 acres of land in Texas. Because most pastors can't afford six acres, much less 60 acres. He loses support that way. And then he showed a young couple of how that he had helped them make $250,000 through Bitcoin. Then another couple, then another couple, how they purchased a new house because of them. I said, this don't sound like Brother Carl. I said, well, let me try it. So I sent him a message. I said, Brother Carl, I said, uh, how much money would it take for a pastor? And I, when I knew if I used the word pastor, he knew he didn't have much money. Okay? I said, how much money would a pastor need to start with you to invest in to have money for retirement? So he messaged me back immediately. And, then, and he said, uh, first of all, 
I saw a red flag. He said, Roger. Now, he would not have addressed me that way. He would have said, Brother Roger, or Brother Hoots, or Pastor, or normally he says, Preacher. I said, well, that's a flag. And then he told me how much money I needed that I could trust him with. Brother Travis, he said, I think maybe $1,000 to $9,000 to get started. I said, okay. So I said, I just said, thank you. I just left it alone. All right, then I washed his account some more. And lo and behold, it, it, it started promoting more. And then all of a sudden, I saw this uh, notice from Brother Carl. Do not respond to anything on Facebook. Do not respond to anything on Messenger. Everything I have has been hacked. And I, that was weeks later, and they're still doing it. And I told Cindy, I said, I knew there was something wrong with this. I smelt a rat. Now, why would somebody spend all that time to hack a good man's name because they're liars and they're thieves and they take advantage of a man's integrity and his honesty. That's what they do. That's what con men do because they don't have it. So they have to steal it and borrow it. So if it sounds too good to be true, it is. Amen? So I'm here to tell you that you need to beware of this. And so the Lord says here that these con men are out for your money. But not only that, but listen, in the religious realm, there are people out there after your soul. And for you, you are simply a number and a name and possibly that would add to their fame but also to their fortune. And that's what they're looking for. So Jesus said, here's what I want you to do. Now I want you to think about this, Brother John. They did not have a whole Bible to carry around with them to be able to check all these guys out. And most of them didn't have a copy of the Old Testament they could take home and read. They had to go to the synagogue and hear it read and hear it explained. So Jesus is talking to the common folks and says, hey, listen. He said, now listen, he also knew that they didn't have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. So how were they to be able to pick up on a false prophet? He said here, he said, verse number 16, you shall know them. Can you know a false prophet? Can you know somebody that's not real? Well, sometimes you have to dig a little deeper, but on the surface you should be able to recognize most of them he says, you shall know them by their, their fruits. By their fruits. By the way, if they are prophets of Christ, if they are preachers of Christ, they will be like Him. They will be holy, godly. They will be harmless. Harmless. And they will have healthy fruit. In other words... He said, these have bad fruit. That means if you partake of them, it's going to be harmful to you. And it's going to hurt you. Whereas, if it's good fruit, it will be healthy and helpful to you as a person and an individual. Now listen carefully. All, all preachers that you know, and by the way, I have to put myself here for you to judge me this morning. I understand that. You need to always inspect preachers. Now, you need to have some respect for preachers until you, they show you something that you should no longer respect them. Okay? See, the word um, trust is something that is, cannot be demanded because of a position. It is something that is earned. It is something that is developed and something that is maintained. Okay, but notice here. Jesus said that all that are professors are not possessors. Verse number 21 makes it very clear. One of the marks of a false preacher and teacher is that he is a self-willed individual. Verse 21 says that, he says, they may call me Lord, he said, but they're going to wind up doing what they want to do regardless of what I say. They're not going to submit themselves to the word of the Lord and the will of God. They're going to do their own thing. All right? And they will have the ability, according to verse number 22, 
to deceive a sign-seeking generation. And that's where we are today. They are intending to mislead, seduce, and if possible, the very elect. Now sis, listen, Satan's strategies are, are the same. They've not changed. He's speaking to the nation of Israel. They're used to false prophets. They're always in the majority. True prophets are always in the minority. When Moses stood before Pharaoh and he proclaimed the will of God, there were a couple of men there that, with, there that withstood Moses and resisted the truth, and they had power. They had power to do some marvelous things in front of Pharaoh. Do you understand? They also could do some of the plagues. They also could throw down their rods and they became serpents. They had power to do wonders and signs. And so it is also in the last days. As a matter of fact, in the book of Acts, Simon the sorcerer, promoted himself that he was a great man of God, but he had the ability to do miracles and wonders. And according to Acts 13, Bar-Jesus, the false prophet, the false preacher, the child of the devil, had the power to do certain things. This power did not come from God, but it was done in the name of the Lord. So, the desire is to seduce and to pervert and to misrepresent God. Let me allow you to encourage you. How do I know, Brother Roger, that I'm following the truth? Well, let me just say, first of all, that Jesus said the shepherd would speak and that the sheep would know his voice. You can know the shepherd's voice. It is possible to know the shepherd's voice. The Holy Ghost now indwells us to guide us unto all truth. The Scriptures are now made available to us to be able to test and prove all things, to hold fast to that which is good. So we have much advantages to what they had here as He is speaking to them. But I will say to you, not only do we have more uh, ability to discern things, but the intensity of deception also has increased. Let's talk about the church and its deception. Turn with me to Acts 15 real quick. Let me show you a couple of verses here, okay? Acts 15. Let me give you some verses, and then I want to give you some exhortations from the Word of God. Turn with me to Acts 15. Let me lay a little bit of groundwork. Acts 15. Notice something here about men and the danger of that. Paul was worried that men would, and so was Peter, and so would, I can't say the Lord Jesus was worried, but he certainly warned us about men that would come in and would pervert the grace of God. Now they do it in two ditches. Is salvation by grace? Either it's all of grace or it's not of grace. It's either all of grace or not of grace. In Acts 15, verse 1, after they had seen multitudes of people getting saved and born again, these religious men, according to Acts 15, verse 1 says, and certain men which came down from Judea taught the brethren and said, except you be circumcised after the manner of Moses, you cannot be saved. Now here's some men who are saying, they talk about, they're not going to deny Jesus, they're going to mention the name Jesus, but they're saying, but you also must do this in order to be saved. That's a warning signal. When somebody says, yes, Jesus, but you must also do this, that should be a very serious red flag to you right there. All right? And then notice something else. Notice with me, here he says that, you don't have to turn there, but I want you to remember this. According to the book of Jude, he said, number one, that they would, they would turn the grace of God into what I call religious bondage. But the other one would turn the grace of God into what we call lasciviousness or lawlessness, meaning that there would be those who 
talk about grace, they say that we are no longer under the Mosaic law, okay? But do you realize that grace actually fulfills the righteousness of the law? And these folks promote that you are no longer under any moral code, meaning that it's whatever that you want to do. And they turn the grace of God into lasciviousness. And I'll prove my point in just a moment about this. But you have to ask yourself this morning, am I on track? Am I on track? All right, now be patient with me. Okay, listen to this. The Bible calls the devil the old serpent. He was all the way back in the garden, doubting and distorting and deceiving. You agree? Listen, you got to work, you're going to have to work at this with your brain and your heart. To work your way through all of the deceitfulness that is out, out there and out here in our realm. You can't be naive and gullible. You say, well, I'm sincere, so I'm okay. I mean, there are many people who have been sincere, who have not been submissive to the Word of God. And there is a way that seems right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. And the God of this world system is a liar. His power lies in deception. He is a deceiver. He is even able to transform himself into an angel of light. Wow, that's pretty scary. The Bible says he's even able to transform his ministers into angels of light. In the Old Testament, false prophets were many. In Elijah's day, he had to face 450 to 1. In Micaiah's day, he had to face 400 to 1. In Jeremiah's day, he was outnumbered. Can I ask you a question? Have you ever wondered in your mind, why does God even allow them to exist? Why doesn't God just wipe them out? Why does God allow there to be a broad way? Why does He allow there to be many false prophets? Why? That question is, is answered, just like the guy who's always asking, why are there so many denominations? Why are there so many religions? Why? Well, God answered that question a long time ago, and it's still true today. He said in Deuteronomy 13, He says, If there arise among you a prophet, or a dreamer of dreams, and giveth thee a sign, or a wonder, and the signs or the wonder come to pass. So they're able to do some of these things. He said, however, he said, then what they do after they do this, then they lead you to go after other gods. He says, don't listen to them. Don't go with them. He said, the Lord your God is allowing this to prove your heart, to see if you love Him, and to see if you will listen to Him, to see if you will choose Him. That's what He's allowing these things to exist. All right, now, I'm going to give you a lot of verses here now. I'm not going to ask you to turn to any of them, but I am going to ask you, if you would, to put your listening ears on. You know why I say that? Because Jesus said he that had ears to hear. I've done the work for you. I'm going to read to you, quote to you, the warnings that are given alone in the New Testament to the New Testament church and believer about what's going on around us. In the book of Acts, let's start there. That's a good place to start with the church. When Paul was with the Ephesus elders, he pulled them aside, and when he was about to leave, he said, For I know this, I know that after my departure shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things and drawing disciples after them. How many Baptist churches have been splintered and split over the personalities and preferences 
of men, most of the time, rarely over doctrine. Paul said in Romans 16, he said, Mark them which cause division and offenses contrary to the doctrine that you have learned. Avoid them and because they serve not the Lord Jesus Christ, but their own bellies. What does that mean? It means their own personal ambitions. They are self-willed. And they use good words and fair speeches and deceive the hearts of the simple. I try as your pastor. Now, you have to examine me. I know that. You're having to examine me as well. And I don't blame you. And a good man, a godly man, is not afraid of that. Not afraid of that. Just make sure that your expectations are biblical. That's all I ask. Amen? Good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. He said in 1 Corinthians 6, now he's written, he said to the church at Ephesus, to the church at Rome, to the church at Corinth, be not deceived. He said the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Now this is important that you understand this, because I'm going to read another verse to you in just a moment that's very, very critical here. He said neither fornicators, idolaters, adulterers, the effeminate, a man that acts womanly. He said, such were some of you, but now you've been washed, you've been sanctified, and you've been justified. He said, you were this way, but now you're this way. But don't be deceived if somebody comforts you in your iniquity. Don't be deceived by that. His second letter he wrote to them, he said, listen, we, talking about men of God, have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully. What does that mean? Well, there are many men who are orators, but they are not expositors. Do you understand the difference? An orator can choose and pick and can speak well, and can even speak dogmatically. Any subject that he wants, and usually it's always the same subject eventually when he gets down to it, but an expositor has to do line upon line, precept upon precept, verse after verse, and book after book, and he doesn't get to choose the subject. He has to deal with the subject that is written. And when you do that, you've got to study, and it's a challenge, and you've got to balance out truth. You don't get to pick and choose. There are men who are great at, at orating their philosophies and their beliefs, but I'm asking you, do they actually expose the Scriptures? Because you have to labor to do that. One is fast food. The other one requires a chef. One orders a short menu, and you can get it quick and go. But the other one, he's got to work at it. He's got to work at it every week. And the menu will be different. The meal will be different every week. Do you understand the difference in the two? He said this, and by the way, a man of God will teach you to listen to the voice of the shepherd, not to his voice. Amen. To teach them to be followers of Christ and the Bible, not followers of a group or a denomination or a philosophy, but Christ. He said this, He that cometh preacheth another Jesus. Is there another Jesus being preached in our day? Yes. Another spirit that is called the Holy Spirit? Yes. Is there another gospel? Yes, which is really not another gospel. He said, no marvel, Satan himself is transformed an angel of light. Such are false apostles, deceitful workers. They will put you in bondage, bring you back under. It's about more about Moses than it is about Jesus. They are takers, not givers. 
They exalt themselves. It's their ministry. You watch a man that moves away from the ministry of a local church, and it's all about promoting his ministry over a local assembly and Christ. Watch that gentleman. I'm not saying you can't have a ministry outside the church, but watch the guy who promotes himself. And they have a problem with the local church. Because in the local church, there is accountability. Yes. To the Galatians, he said, there be some that troubled you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. He said, he said if, if it's a man or an angel from heaven, and the Mormons should take that warning very carefully. As the angel Moroni gave them their books. How deceitful are the Mormons? They'll send you a King James Bible so that they can send you another book that goes with it. Amen. That came from an angel that perverts the gospel of Jesus Christ. To the Ephesians. Here's what he said in chapter 4, Brother John. He said, and I'm paraphrasing, hurry up and grow up. Be no more children. Don't be carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men in cunning craftiness who lie in wait to deceive. But here's why I warned you about 1 Corinthians 6, Brother Lauren. Listen, he said about morality. Do you think that Christianity should change the morality or control the morality of an individual? Here's what he said. Let no man deceive you with vain words. For because of these things, what things? Fornication, uncleanness, filthiness, adultery, lying, stealing, thieving. He said, because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. He said, don't let any man deceive you. If you think that you can live in wickedness and immorality and hang on to a profession of faith that you made when you were 12 years old and lived like the devil... He said, somebody's deceiving you. He said to the Colossians, man, you talk about a book about deception. He said, beware lest any man beguile you with enticing words, spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit. This is where you get caught up in that you're looking for the education of a man rather than his ability to expose the Scriptures. You want to know what school he went to, not whether or not he can really understand the Word of God. And so you get caught up in their vain philosophies and their uh, worldly views of things. And he goes on to say this, you're complete in Christ. If a man moves you away from that, he's a deceiver. So he warns them, legalism, mysticism, asceticism. By the way, asceticism leads to Phariseeism. In other words, you feel like that you're more spiritual than everybody else is because of what you don't do. Rather than what you do for the glory of God. Antinomianism. You ever heard that word? How many of you ever heard of the word antinomianism? Oh, well, a few of you have. Some of you say, I don't know, is that a disease? Antinomianism. Well, that's in, that's in Colossians 3. That's grace that leads to lasciviousness. That's no Mosaic law, no moral law, where Paul said you are to mortify your members. Mortify your members. No adultery, no fornication, things of that nature. In other words, if you're under grace, it makes no difference how you live. Now, that's a lie, I'm just telling you. Grace transforms a man's life. Okay? Then he gets to the church at Thessalonica. He said, our exhortation was not of deceit. I'm always listening to a man, watching a man, and yes, inspecting a man. Always. If I'm listening to him on the radio, if I'm at a Bible conference, if I'm at a camp meeting, if I'm sitting across the table, I'm always inspecting someone who is handling the Scriptures. And he said to them, he said, Our exhortation was not of deceit, uncleanness, or guile, or flattering words. He said, You need to know them, you need to know them, me, that labor among you. Meaning, you need to inspect 
men who are over you in your life spiritually. He went on to say, don't get an attitude of, well, I just don't trust anybody. He said, do not despise prophesying. Don't throw away preaching out of your life. He said, but prove all things and hold fast to that which is good. I like people who do not check their brains at the door. Amen? But however, you might want to sometimes check your tongue at the door. But don't check your brain at the door. The Lord wants you to prove all things, hold fast to that which is good. Boy, you talk about a book about again about deceit. You ought to read 2 Thessalonians. He wrote them two letters. He said, let no man deceive you by any means about the coming of the Lord. Millions and millions of dollars have been made on books written about eschatology and movies and, uh, and uh, DVDs on eschatology. He warns us, however, whatever you may think about eschatology, the Lord is coming back. And he said he called him the wicked one whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. So we're heading into that time of where demonic activity is going to increase. Brother Welder and I were talking on the phone Monday, I think it was, and he's an older gentleman. He's at he's 70 now. He's been in the ministry for 30 or 40 years. And he said, Brother Roger, I've never seen it on this wise. And I said, I agree with you, brother. I said, the level of spiritual uh, warfare has intensified. He is wearing out the saints. He is pulling apart families and Christians and churches and preachers as fast as he can. We are in the last of the last of the last days. But listen, I'm still on the winning side. This still is my father's world. But I do want you to know that there is a big warning. He says, if you won't receive the truth, he said, you will believe a lie. This is why it's critical that you be open to the truth, to examine the Scriptures like the Bereans, to see if these things be so. He said, for, he said, for God Himself will allow Satan to deceive you if you reject Him. God will allow the devil to deceive you. When he wrote to a young pastor, he said this. Seven times in 1 Timothy, he mentioned Satan and demons and evil spirits. Do you believe they exist? Some of you are thinking, well, I haven't seen anybody demon-possessed. Well, you're thinking of something like The Exorcist, probably, or some of the goofy movies that they make. But a man that perverts the Scriptures and can seduce you with smooth words and lead you away from the truth and the Word of God and Christ has an evil spirit. And he said that, listen carefully, the Holy Spirit speaketh expressly. That's, that's almost like he's screaming. He said, hey, church, in the latter times, people will depart from the faith. They will give heed to seducing spirits. They will follow doctrines of devils. And he said it will be religions that will bind and blur the message of the cross. I don't know one greater than that than Roman Catholicism that does that very thing. Many of these religions are legalistic in nature, ascetic in nature, whether it be Mormonism, or whether it be Buddhism, or even Islam. Some of these religions teach that you're more spiritual if, and they forbid you to marry. Certain diets are exercised. Certain days are observed to make you more religious. The Catholicism, Seventh-day Adventists, the Mormons, the, I don't call them JWs. I call them JFWs. They are Jehovah's false witnesses. Second letter to Timothy, he said, This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come, that people would have a form of godliness, but deny the power or the authority thereof. This bum fuzzles me. It frustrates me. 
in that trying to be very careful in dealing with sinners and being very cautious, do they understand? Are they, do they realize who and what they are and who Christ is? And yet there are still some who have a form of godliness, and when it comes right down to what the Bible says, they will not submit themselves and do what the Bible says. He also said these men are creeps. They are. I've met a few creeps. They are corrupt. The Bible says these creeps, they come in after women who are filled with lust and deceive them. They are corrupt men. They are seducers. And Paul said they would wax worse and worse in the last days. He said they would even have the ability to perform miracles and deeds that would make you wonder, and we are headed in that direction. We are. Titus said they will profess that they know God, but even in their mind and conscience is defiled, and they will refuse to submit themselves and be obedient to the Word of God. James said that you need to be a doer of the Word and not hearer only lest you deceive your own self. Peter said that there were false prophets among the people in the past, even as there shall be false teachers among you. Now here's his description of them. He said they are pernicious. What that word is? Pernicious. That means they're dangerous. They're destructive. He said they're covetous. They'll make merchandise of you, like a Kenneth Copeland, a Benny Hinn, a Paula White, a Creflo Dollar. The Bible says that their character will be an issue. They are presumptuous. They are self-willed. They are bold and dogmatic. And listen, you can hear a man get up and preach with boldness and dogmatism and rail against authorities, and it will appeal to you, the rebellious side that you've got in you. If I were to get up this morning and rail on President Biden, why some of you would go out here and say, man, that was some good preaching. Because it appeals to our conservative, God-fearing, Bible-believing side of us. But on the Bible side of it, we're to pray for those who are in authority. Because it appeals to my flesh when somebody rails on those who are in authority. Because there's a rebel that lives way back in the corner of my heart. There's a rebel that... I'm not talking about an old Miss rebel or a Mississippi rebel. I'm talking about there's a rebel down in there. And it responds to people who speak evil of those in authority, always railing against the police officer or the teacher or the preacher, always speaking evil of those in authority, always after them. He said, you better watch this. He said, they, are, they have eyes full of adultery. Do you understand the seriousness of that? They're looking your wife and they are looking your daughter over. These men are looking your ladies over. Their eyes are full of adultery. And by the way, that includes the female preachers and pastors. They promise what they cannot produce. They are unprofitable. They're like, they're, they're like whales without water. They're like clouds without rain. You know what John said? He said, little children, this is the last time. You've heard that the Antichrist shall come. Even now, there are many Antichrists whereby we know that it is the last time. He said, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets are going out into the world. Many, many. In 2 John, he said, for many deceivers are entered into the world. Do you realize I have quoted to you chronologically throughout the whole, every book in the New Testament? warns you about being deceived and deceivers. He said, for many deceivers are entered into the world, and, and he said, and if they come, if any of them come and bring not this doctrine, talking about Jesus Christ, he said, don't receive him into your house. Don't even bid him God's speed. You know what Jude said? Jude said that we must earnestly contend for the faith of our common salvation. 
Certain men crept in unaware, turning the grace of God into lasciviousness. There is an absence in their life of moral restraint. They despise authority. They are fearless. They are shameless. They are fruitless. They are murmurers and complainers. They are sensual, having not the spirit. Okay? Now, I've just read to you and quoted from you all. Listen, I'm just trying to give you some doctrine. Sometimes you've got to endure sound doctrine. Don't always enjoy sound doctrine. You endure it. You receive it, though. And you think on it. I'm warning you. I just read to you all those church epistles. Now we're standing on, right, on, right on, the, on, on the diving board of going into the book of Revelation. Are you kidding me? The book of Revelation is all about he who is going to deceive the whole world. And how is he going to do it? It lays it out for you. The churches that he writes to, those seven churches that not only represent local churches, but I think also ages of the church age. He warns them. He said to the church at Ephesus, Man, I thank God for you. He said, Man, you tried those who said they were apostles, and they found them to be liars. When's the last time that you really checked on somebody that's influencing you? I don't mind you doing that to me. I don't. I don't mind you checking out and say, hey, you need to. It is your destiny. It's your soul. It's your family. And any preacher that is upset with somebody, I'm not talking about, the Bible says I'm to avoid your foolish questions, that gender strife. But a preacher's got to be approachable and say, what did you mean by this? Or what do you believe about this? But let it be about something that matters. Amen? Let it be about something that matters. Because I'm not going to argue with you about your preferences. But if it's Bible doctrine, I'll be glad to talk to you. Do you understand here? He's saying, listen, understand that these, these men, warnings in the book of Revelation, oh my goodness. He said there are people who profess to be Jews and are not. Those who claim, I think those are those in our day who claim the promises of Israel when they don't belong to you. It's amazing to me how the name it, claim it, blab it, grab it crowd wants to claim the promises of Israel but not the curses that go along with it. He said the doctrines of Balaam would be introduced which always leads to fornication. And that is how God has divided many churches and many families of where you've got a lost boy courting a saved girl or a lost girl courting a saved boy, pulling them out. Because most, I'm going to say, I'm going to say something very plainly here so that you don't misunderstand me. And I don't mean to offend you. Please, don't be too sissified right here. But there are a lot of boys and girls, a lot of men and women that turn 20, 25 years of age, and 30. And they love the bedroom more than they love the Bible. And they will make their decisions based on that and not what the Bible says. You understood that, didn't you? And so even though the Lord says do not... Be unequally yoked together with an unbeliever. But I love him. But the Lord says, don't do it. I'm not saying God can overcome some of those things. He's very gracious and kind. But in most cases, you're going to regret it. You're going to regret it. For Jezebel comes on the scene in the book of Revelation. That's, that's, that's a woman. That's a woman who behind the scene manipulates her husband, Ahab. That's a woman who does not submit herself to the authority of her husband, and she may be married to a man who's not man enough to lead her. But she knows how to work through him and through his authority to get done what she wants done, regardless of who it hurts. And I can tell... I can tell when a man approaches me with a problem and an issue, I can tell 
that it's who's talking through him. You say, that offends me. I'm just telling you, I've been around a while. I can tell of whether it's him or whether it's her speaking through him. I can tell. And the spirit of Jezebel still reigns today. Women who profess to be pastors, who preach the word of God, who are nothing but rebels, who glory in their shame. They ought to be ashamed. Paula White ought to be ashamed. Then there's the doctrine of the deeds of the Nicolaitans. That's that separation between laity and clergy. You understand the difference? What, 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 listen, what does that difference does that make? Well, listen, you don't need a preacher to be able to talk to God. You don't need a priest to be able to talk to God. You can do that on your own. And the only thing that separates me from you is that I have a different gift and I have a church office. I'm not talking about the one upstairs. I'm talking about my position. But we are all on the same level. We are equal. I just simply have a different role of responsibility. That's it. And something happened many, many, many moons ago that separated the laity from the clergy. Then comes the false prophet and the beast with his miracles, his deceitfulness. And you saw this approaching us during COVID. It's going to increase. It's going to happen. Something's going to happen. And it's going to be reasonable. And it's going to be rational. And it's going to be financial. And it's going to be connected religiously. Of where that you will not be able to buy or sell or keep your job or keep your house or do business without taking the mark. It's coming. And if you reject the truth, you'll agree with it. And you'll be deceived by it. Now, I ain't planning on being here. But I think we're going to get close to it. I do. You say, well, Brother Roger, you've, you've left us with so much negativity. All right. Well, it's time for your lunch. Are you ready for some positivity? Am I on the right track? As a believer, I'll tell you one more verse. Let's go to the house. Turn to Romans chapter 6. While you're turning there, let me say this. Would you right now consider the work of the Holy Spirit so that you'll know? You're, you're to inspect me. Did you know that God gave you the book of Titus, Brother Stewart, so that you could protect yourself of where you go to church? Amen. That you have the right to look a man over and consider his leadership and his... Um, uh, and his traits in his life. The book of Titus is written to protect you. You're to know them. And it's not all about his personality. It's about his personal traits. It's about whether or not he has character, integrity. Whether or not he loves his family, his wife. Does he love his wife? Does he love his children? Does he have character, integrity? Can you trust him with your money? Can you trust him with your mate? Can you trust him with your children? Is he willing to be held accountable as a steward of God? You watch out for a man who never wants to be held accountable or questioned. A man that cannot be self-willed a man that's temperate and self-controlled with his anger. Doesn't mean he can't get angry. He just can't be given to it and soon angry. His appetites. He's got to be self-controlled and temperate. He's got to let go of his own personal ambitions to do the will of God and not be seeking after money. He has to be accessible. He has to be approachable. He has to be a lover of hospitality. He has to be willing to be around the sheep. He has to be faithful to the scriptures. He has to have some courage and not be passive when it comes to men who visit the church who claim to be preachers and evangelists and missionaries. He has to be careful of who joins the assembly as best he can. He has to watch for those things. So you ask yourself, are you on the right track? Well, I'm on a 
I'm asking myself, Lord, am I really saved? Am I on track here? I'm not talking about preacher. I'm talking about as a believer. I have to consider the work of the Holy Spirit in my life. He convinced me. He convinced me that I was a sinner. He did that. He convinced me through the Word of God that I was a sinner. He convicted me that I did not have the righteousness that I must have in order to go to heaven. He convinced me of that. And He convinced me that I was facing the judgment of God and righteously so, and that the only hope and the only answer I had was Jesus Christ the Lord. That if I would bow my knee and call upon Him, He would save me. The Holy Spirit did that in my heart, my life. I can't claim it. I can only say He, by work of grace, did that for me. And then I see Him, look in Romans chapter 6, look in verse 17 and 18. Look at this. Uh, let me back up to verse number 15. Uh, verse 14. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law but under grace. What then shall we sin because we are not under the law but under grace? What's the answer to that? God forbid. Look at verse 17. I love this. But God be thanked. God be thanked that you were the servants of sin. That's what I was. But you have obeyed from the what? The heart. That form of doctrine which was delivered you. Being made free from sin, you became the servants of righteousness. I can testify and say God did that in my life right there. God broke the power of sin in my life. You say, you never sinned? I didn't say that. He broke the power of it. It does not control me. I'm a new creature in Christ. Am I on the right track? One of the manifestations of continuing on the narrow path and knowing that you're following the truth, John said this, They went out from us because they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us that they went out, that they might be made manifest that they were not of us. What is that? That is... A continuing work in your heart. It just continues. You just can't quit. That's not that you don't quit. Sometimes God just don't let you completely quit. You may quit in your heart, but He won't quit. He just can't quit. God just keeps bringing you back. Just keeps bringing you back and bringing you back. I want to encourage you tonight, or this morning, to trust the Lord. Examine me. But examine thee. Inspect me, but inspect thee. You look for the fruit not only in me, but you look for the fruit that is in you. Are you a hearer only? But do you, are you one of those who have built your house upon the rock because you are listening to the voice of the shepherd and whatever he says you ought to do, you are willing to do it as long as you know it's his voice and you know it's scriptural and you know it's right. You're ready to do it. That's your attitude. It's one of submission and of following. Sometimes the devil comes along and tries to get you off track with that. And take advantage of it. But the shepherd is always there. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. And he says, you have overcome them. Talking about the false prophets and the false spirits because of the Spirit of God living in you. And if you'll be sensitive to him, search the Scriptures and submit yourself to His will, He'll protect you. He will guide you. He will help you. Men, you're driving a bus with your family on it. Be sure that you're on the straight and the narrow path. You inspect who influences your family. Books, tapes, videos, preachers, churches, you inspect it. You inspect it biblically. But then you examine yourself as well. Let it not just be looking like a telescope way out there looking at everybody else. But let it also turn around and be a mirror where that you look in your own heart and say, God, 
I want to do your will. Lord, there's fruit in my life. Lord, I'm harmless. I want to be holy. I want to be helpful. I want to be a blessing. Lord, you've put that in my heart. I'm talking about you and me. Christians should be salt and light and a blessing to this ungodly, filthy, vile, deceptive world. You're going to be in the minority. But press on. Somebody's going to ask you, who's your pastor? You invite them to church. Who's your pastor? And you know what? You can't really tell much about a man by coming to one service. You can't tell much about a man by uh, visiting a church a time or two. You know, you just have to watch and do the very best you can to listen and observe. Don't be too quick about it. But don't be too slow about it. Amen? And then watch the kind of men that have watched him that are in leadership in the church. That will help you as well. Amen? All right, let's stand together, please. I know I've been long this morning, longer than normal. Take this. Put it away. I didn't say throw it away. Put it away. Think about it. Meditate on it. Inspect me and inspect thee. Let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, would you please, dear God, help our folks. Lord, even as I've dealt with these evil spirits this morning and the deceitfulness of it and the wickedness of it, I have felt their resistance this morning. Lord, I didn't expect it to be easy. But Lord, I do expect it to be effective. And I pray, Almighty God, that the Holy Spirit during the week would warn our men and our women with something they heard today that would be a red flag. And God, that they would have the courage to search the Scriptures and seek the truth. For things are not always as they sound or as they appear. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You're dismissed. God bless you.